Hello and welcome to Lab 1, Earth's Geographic Grid. I'll be your instructor for this lab and for several others as you'll see. My name is Jeremy Patrich. I am a geographer and geologist here in California. I'm very excited to share this lab manual with you as it is a collaborative work done by faculty such as myself and several others throughout the state of California. We have been able to present to you an OER text, meaning an Open Education Resource Lab Manual, the first of its kind that's been designed for students like you to be able to have a free textbook for this course. I kind of want to very quickly mention how this is set up. First, every lab is going to have a list of objectives. It's going to have some background information, it's going to have some activities, it's going to have some resources such as QR codes that may require you to use your cell phone uh, to take photos of some of those things and you get transported into a different location or realm or maybe a different video so you might see me again in some other lectures. So it's very engaging and we're very excited to present this. Another reason why I'm making this video in particular and as I will for the remaining uh, labs that we'll be utilizing this semester is because sometimes you might be taking this class online or maybe you're taking it in a hybrid type or maybe in a complete face-to-face, -face, you're back in the classroom. And I just feel that these videos are very helpful because sometimes you need further instructions and other times time goes by and perhaps you forget well, how did I do that? So this will be a great resource for you to be able to go back to, to remind yourself as to the steps that we took in order to solve some of these questions. Uh, also throughout my YouTube channel, you will find additional support. I have a playlist called How To's, uh, which are all really tied to these labs, how to do something in specific. <laughs> so how to calculate uh, latitude and longitude, or how to do the public land survey, or how to uh, calculate adiabatic lapse rate, or whatever it might be. So there's lots of resources on this website, so be sure to subscribe, uh, so just in case there's something Something else you need don't forget to reach out and I can certainly help you with that so that being said uh, welcome and let's get going let's start lab number one so lab number one is Earth's geographic grid so as you can see we have our list of objectives we have our basic introduction that kind of provides some background information so I really want to start actually on the next page I want to talk about some of these diagrams. So as we can see, figure one, this one that we can observe right here, uh, provides an illustration of how we can pinpoint a location on Earth by using latitude and longitude. Uh, now what we can see here is that we have two things we're talking about, latitude and longitude. Latitude are lines that are parallel to one another. I often think of latitude like pizza. We've all ordered pizza before and there's different sizes pizza. There's small, medium, and large. But regardless of their size, they're still a complete circle. So latitude is really the same way. It's a bunch of these pans. The equator is the largest you know, drawing around the earth, the largest pizza. And as you get farther away from the equator, even though there's still a line going all the way around, the distance becomes smaller, smaller disks and the key is that they're parallel. Now, longitude, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Instead of being this way, they're this way, and they're only half. They're called meridians. They're half of what we call a great circle, and they all intersect at the north and the south pole. So they're half of great circles. So I often think of longitude like an orange. So you peel the orange away and you're left with all the little bits of oranges that are all connected to the top and the bottom and they can peel off into small slices or meridians. So between just those types of lines, we can easily create a pinpointing location. So something to also think about, as you can see in this diagram, you see how the arrows kind of focus from the middle and pointing outward, is that imagine that you're in the center of the earth and your hand represents you know, the surface. So if I put my hand straight out and I cut myself into two equal hemispheres, a northern and a southern, that line straight out would represent my equator and I would draw that line going all the way around. So if that, my arm itself were a protractor, this would be at zero degrees and I'd draw my line going all the way around. Now, as a protractor, if this is zero, the highest angle I can make is going to be 90 degrees. That's going to be at the North Pole or 90 degrees south at the South Pole. So the way it's done is that the angle is measured, so maybe this is at 23 degrees, and then that line is drawn going all the way around. 
So when looking at latitude, the greatest latitude or value you can have would be 90 and the lowest will be zero. Now, when looking at longitude, it's a little bit different. Instead of going up and down, I'm looking from side to side. So at this point, we start at zero, which happens to be the prime meridian in Greenwich, England. And I can either go east or west. Well, if my arm is a protractor, the farthest my arm can go behind me is 180. That's the farthest I can go both ways, which makes sense because 180 plus 180 is 360 degrees, which is a complete circle. So what's interesting is that it's based on east or west. So you can work your way from 0, 1, east, 2, east, 3, east, so on and forth until you get to 180 and same thing with west. Once your angle is drawn, then the line goes up and down and it intersects with the north and the south pole. So that's really how you then create this. So then we're able to identify a specific location like this one here. This line here is saying that from zero, it is 40 degrees north and 60 degrees east of the prime meridian. So it's 40 degrees north of the equator and 60 degrees east of the prime meridian. And that's able to pinpoint an exact location. Often students say, well, how, why does this even matter? Like, uh, wh when do I even use this? You use it every day. You just don't see it. It's in your cell phone. Your cell phone pinpoints your exact location by utilizing GPS coordinates from satellites, which is essentially taking satellite data and this map that we're looking at here and marking your known location. So we're able to see where you are. Or perhaps if you have one of those apps where you go running or you, where you walk and it you know, traces where you've gone. It's plotting your latitude and longitude on your entire journey and plotting it out. So down here in this next diagram, figure 1.2, I mentioned this earlier about a great circle. A great circle is the greatest circle that can be drawn on the globe. Anything smaller is considered a small circle. So when speaking of latitude, there's only one great circle, the equator. Everything else will have to be smaller than that. Well, what's interesting is if we, you know, again, if this represents the great circle, if we look at longitude and I rotate it this way, if you partner each half circle with its opposite side, it will create a great circle. So technically, all lines of longitude, if they're partnered with the line on the other side, will represent great circles and there's no small circles when looking at lines of longitude. On the other side, with latitude, there's only one great circle and the rest are all small circles. So let's look at our first activity, part A, latitude and longitude. So the Earth's geographic grid is based on a division of a circle, which can be observed as either lines of latitude or longitude. So please observe figure 1.3. So you can see that I've drawn our lines of latitude as well as our longitude, and then I've also shown, you know, really that measurement. How do we do that from 0 to 90, or going this way from 0 to 180? So question one is asking you to refer to figure 1.3 and to answer the following questions regarding that diagram. So as an example, question A says, latitude is measured to the north or south of the what? What special line of latitude divides those two regions? So you're gonna go ahead and plug in your answers there. So we're gonna move forward to question two. Question two says, in one or two sentences, describe the differences between great and small circles. And question three says, on figure 1.3, label an example or identify one uh, of a great circle and an example of a small circle. So moving forward, we can look at distance, the length of a degree. Because lines of latitude are parallel to one another, the measurable distance between them from north to south will remain constant or the same. So the distance between a line at zero traveling northward to perhaps a line at 15 degrees north and to 30 and 45, that distance going up and down will remain the same. 
But let's look at the actual circumference or distance going around. As you gain latitude, as you head from 0 to 90, the distance around the Earth becomes smaller. So it says here, as the angular distance changes between the lines of longitude, the distance along a line of latitude will either increase or decrease. To better understand this, let's look at, at table 1.1. We can see that along the equator, if you're traveling along the equator at zero degrees, the distance around the Earth per degree is 69.171 miles, or statute miles, per degree. Uh, we live, well, I live at least, in uh, northern Los Angeles at about 34 degrees north. So I'll just use 30. So at 30 degrees north, I can see that the distance around the Earth per degree is 59.956 miles per degree. So we can see that even if I was at the equator versus where I live now, that there is significant you know, difference in that distance around the Earth. My favorite would be 90 degrees north or south, is that it's zero miles per degree. So think of it like this. If you had to race someone around the world, going all the way around on a line of latitude, which latitude would you want to be on to be the fastest? Well, if we're at the equator, you have 69.171 miles per degree to go all the way around and we know that the whole world is 360 degrees around so you would multiply those two to get the total distance well what if you're at the north pole well it's 360 degrees all the way around at 0, 0.000 miles per degree you literally just turn around and you technically ran around the world so which line of latitude would be the best it would be at the 90 degree north or south point because that is the shortest distance around the world. Another way that you can visualize this that I often talk about in my classes is if you've ever seen like professional track and field or when they do uh, race cars, they stagger it because if you're closest inward, the distance around the track will be smaller. The farther away you are from the center of that track, the greater that distance you'll make. And it's kind of similar in that perspective. So as we can see, there are some questions. Question four says, refer to table 1.1 and answer the following question. So as an example, letter A says, how does the length of longitudes change as latitude is increased? So be sure to then answer questions four. I'm gonna to move to the next page. Letters A through D. Now, the next step after you've mastered that is we can look at actually calculating distance between two points. So before we were looking at distances around the world, but what about between two spots? So I, I love this diagram. I drew this up. It just helps me visualize uh, that concept. So it says, how would you calculate the distance of the Earth between two people on the same line of latitude? So that would be like someone who lived, like if I, at my house, I'm on this line of latitude and I'm here, and you live here on the same line of latitude, could I calculate the miles, the distance between those two? And the answer is of course you can. That's exactly what you do when you use your maps or any of your applications to calculate distances when you're traveling. We're just gonna see how is that done. So it says here, step one, first find the sum of the total longitudinal distance between those two points. And then step two says to multiply that by the statute miles per degree at the shared line of latitude. So as an example, it says here for figure 1.4, there's someone who lives at 90 west and someone who lives at 30 east and they're both on the same line of latitude. So how would you calculate that? Well, first I need to, for step one, is calculate the total distance of degrees between them. So I would go, well, 90 to zero, and then zero to 30. If I add those up, that's a total of 120 degrees in distance. Perfect. So I know that the distance between the two locations, those two people, is 120 degrees. Well, now I need to see what line of latitude they're on to find what I need to multiply it by. Now, some people often ask a couple things that I just want to kind of provide for you. This graph represents a line of latitude, any line of latitude. I visualize it as if I went to the globe and I grabbed a line of latitude and I peeled it off the globe and I placed it here because I have it set up as zero being um, 
where the prime meridian is. And I can see that there's 180 east and 180 west that represent that distance in that direction. There's no such thing as 180 east or 180 west. It's the same line. Remember, it's a circle all the way around. I just plot it like this so I can visualize that there's left and right hand sides. So I'm able to see that. So what you're going to do uh, is moving forward is you're going to solve a couple of these doing the same thing. So the first step is plot it and find out how many degrees separate those two people or those two locations. And then the next step is to, I'm going to change the page, I'm going to go upward, referring to this, so maybe they're at 60 degrees south. Well, that means whatever the amount of degrees that separate them, you multiply that by 34.674 because it's 34.674 miles per degree of distance when traveling along that line, okay? So I'm going to skip back to page 5. So you're going to be able to complete this uh, for questions 5 and 6. Now the next step is a little bit more complicated looking at degrees, minutes, and seconds. Because what we're looking at first is we've learned that, okay, so we have a grid system. And we have a system of latitude and longitude. And they have degree values. You know, um, when speaking about latitude, it goes from 0 to 90. Longitude is from 0 to 180. You got it. Perfect. But we also learned that there's a big distance or difference between the value of just one degree. So from, from going from zero to one, depending on uh, what line of latitude you're on, it can be a very significant distance. Well, how do we subdivide it? Well, the primary unit in which latitude and longitude are observed is known as degrees. And as learned earlier, the distance of these degrees can be quite large, which is why it is important that the subdivision of a degree be understood. There are two formats for subdividing degrees. We can look at it as decimal degrees and des uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. So this is going to teach us a little bit about both of those. So it says in order to understand DMS or um, degrees, minutes, and seconds, you must know that the degree sign is an abbreviation for degree, that one uh, quotation, one mark, a tick mark, is known as minutes, and then two represent seconds. Nothing to do with time, but it can be observed like that. So we have 60 seconds is equal to one minute and 60 minutes can be equal to one degree or one hour, okay? So it's very similar to that concept. So what you'll do is you're gonna read through this portion. There's some tips and some hints that will help you work through it. Uh, I can also suggest down here, if you need additional help, there's this great video uh, that was prepared for by Scott, who was one of the collaborators on this uh, lab manual. And you can just take your cell phone, and take a photo of that QR code, or you can just click on the hyperlink there from the PDF lab, and it will take you to a video, again, further explaining how to do this. But again, I, the way that I always think about this activity is that it's just like borrowing time, right? So it's like, if you tell someone, oh, I'll be there in 160 seconds, that doesn't make sense. You would want to convert that. Well, 160 seconds is the same as uh, 2 minutes and 40 seconds. So you would say, oh, I'll be there in 2 minutes and 40 seconds. And so that's what your activity is, is to correct that, is to understand how do you move back and forth between those. So you'll be able to uh, complete questions 8. This video will be very helpful that's been shared here to do question number 9. And then we can move here to just why is this important? Well, this information is helpful in understanding locations on both digital and paper mediums. We still use paper maps. In fact, I have about 300,000 topographic maps from across the world in my garage. We still use them, both from a historical context and for understanding the future. So it's very important that we at least understand the basics or fundamentals. Again, like I said, most of this has actually just been computed in your cell phones, which is pretty cool, but now we're gonna learn how to do it. So the next thing that we're gonna do is, as you can see, there's a thing that says pin it with a little push pin. So that's gonna take you to a, another website that's gonna ask you to work on some of these activities. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna click uh, Latitude and Longitude Finder. It's gonna take you to a website and you're going to look up these locations and you're going to convert and understand what is that location in decimal degrees 
and what is that location in DMS or degrees, minutes, and seconds. So it's going to have you look at two locations in California uh, that will allow you to utilize the you know that digital piece and to then compute it into degrees, minutes, and seconds. Again, if you have challenges or you get you know kind of stuck on that conversion, remember on the previous page there's that video shared by Scott on how to do that. So when looking at special lines of latitude, we've got this terrific diagram that's been drawn, figure 1.6, denoting the special lines of latitude. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn what the values are and why they're important. So question 12 says refer to figure 1.6 and complete or fill in table 1.2. Be sure to include if the latitude is north or south of the equator. So you're technically just pulling the information from figure 1.6 and plotting it in uh, table 1.2 uh, rather. The next thing you're going to do is it says using the information from 1.6, figure 1.6, and table 1.2, so these two images here, sketch and label each of these special lines of latitude on the map below. So I'm going to swap down to that page there. So we can see there's a, a, a map, a Robinson projection map of the world. Uh, which we'll talk about more of, of what the different types of projections are and the distortion and, uh, and that later. But your job is to take the information from above, so I'm going to scroll up again, this data, the North Pole, the Arctic Circle, Tropic of Cancer, the Equator, the Tropic of Capricorn, Antarctic Circle, and the South Pole, and identify where they would be on this map. Uh, I highly suggest using a, like a colored pencil or a crayon, something other than like a normal pencil or black pen because it will be easier for us to grade if it's in using some form of color. So identify where they are and their name and always include their degrees and denote north or south. You must always include that because as you'll see, I'll scroll up one more time. We have the North Pole and the South Pole. So if you just said, you know, the North Pole is at 90 degrees, that's not necessarily correct because is it is it 90 degrees north or south I know that the name says North Pole but just get in the habit of always denoting the north or south element to it or when we talk about longitude the east or west always get in that habit because that's going to make it very clear as the specification of the location that you're speaking of all right so let's look at this the next part, the geographic grid. In this portion of the lab, you will be applying previously learned content and applying it together on this map. So the first thing that you're gonna do uh, for question number 14, label the lines of latitude and longitude along the edge of the map. They are in 30 degree increments. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if this line here, we know that represents the equator. So I'm going to write zero degrees equator. And I know that this line here will represent 30 degrees north. So I'm going to write 30 degrees north. You're going to identify all of the marked latitudes and longitudes. Why is that important? Because we're going to learn how to identify and plot specific points on this map. So then after you do that, it says question 14 part B what are the coordinates for the location labeled A? So we can see there's a letter A with a dot. Well, what is the latitude and longitude of letter A? So once you've labeled all those numbers, it's gonna make it so much easier. So as we move forward, you're gonna identify the location, latitude and longitude of point B, and then you will plot the location for letters C, D, E, F, G and H. Pretty easy. So you, I provide you the latitude and longitude and you plug it right in as to where it belongs on that map. Now, let's make it a little more complicated. As we can see letter J, it says using that map, calculate the distance in degrees between points A and D. So once everything's been plotted, you're gonna calculate the distance, the degree distance between point A and D. And then you're gonna convert that into miles, just like you did a couple of questions ago. So be sure that you not only answer what the distance is in degrees, but then to calculate it based on that distance. 
and the line of latitude in the statute miles, or how many miles per degree at that latitude, to provide both of those answers. The next part is looking at, or part B, rather, is Earth's time zones. So time on Earth can be observed two ways, either by using the sun or utilizing standard time. So my watch that I'm wearing here is standard time. It's an agreed upon time. Solar time actually uses the sun to denote the actual time. They don't often line up, you know, the perfectly and so that's why we prefer standard time uh, just because it's easier and it's more universal and we'll talk a little bit about why uh, in a moment but we will certainly look at both of these but most of the activity that we're going to be dealing with here is dealing specifically with solar time so what if we were uh, out on a ship in the ocean without a watch and all we had was the sun how could we establish the time based on the um, location of the sun in the sky and our location as well and the answer is yes we can and we'll learn how to do that so let's move on to the next page so this image here is denoting a sundial perhaps you have one or you've seen one so what it does is the sundial is, is projecting a shadow based on the angle in which the sun is in the sky and when it is hitting the sundial it ends up reflecting the date uh, the time of day in which it is at that location so, it says here, check it out. Uh, here's a, a great resource, an interactive sundial, so you can see how this works if you've never used one before. It says, for the section of this lab, you will investigate standard time and solar time. Each mean solar day, meaning that the average solar day, is 24 hours, and the Earth rotates 360 degrees in one day. That means that each hour, the Earth is technically rotating 15 degrees of longitude, which is equivalent to one degree of longitude for every four minutes. So what does that mean? Well, if the Earth, we know that it takes an entire year for the Earth to go around the sun. We're talking about just a solar day. If the Earth itself was a clock, which it's not, but if it was, we know that every hour it would click 15 degrees, click 15 degrees every hour, which means if you take 15 degrees per hour, 15 degrees times a 24 hour day, you will then learn that the Earth would then spin around 360 degrees. So that's what it's stating here uh, with those additional bullet points. So it says here that figure 1.11 is a global time zone map. So let's look at that. Here's our global time zone map. We can see that everything is based off of uh, the, well, the prime meridian, Greenwich, England, and everything is either going to be west of that location or east. But we can see that as it moves along, that it's about every 15 degrees is a difference in hours at that exact moment. So if I'm you know, at zero at this exact moment and I called someone over here, then they're going to be two hours different than what I am at this exact moment by utilizing the sun and standard time which I think makes sense, right? If you have friends, if you live in California and you have friends who live in New York and you call someone in New York, are they going to be at a different time than you are? And the answer is yes, of course they are. So now we need to establish at exact moments, or is it later or earlier in time, which is, it can be complicated, right? Because technically, if you think about it, it you know, New York, when they do the ball drop every year on New Year's Eve, you know, it happens before we experience in California the ball drop on New Year's Eve, right? So they experience it before us, which means at this exact moment for me, they must be later in time, right? Which makes sense. So if I call someone in New York right now, it will be later in the day for them because the sun has moved past them, right? And now we're experiencing that sunlight that they had once had, which is kind of interesting to think about. Another question that comes up is, well, why aren't these lines perfectly straight? And the answer is, is because that's that, that the liberties of looking at solar versus standard time is that because of the sun, it doesn't pay any mind to towns or homes or regions. So based on that line that the sun makes as it moves across, it could literally cut a house into two different time zones. So what we've done is we have kind of jigged it, as they say, which means we kind of move things around to make it work best for states, countries, uh, and, and really communities in that sense. So we kind of have that liberty of moving things around. 
So uh, based on figure 1.11, the time zone map, you'll be able to answer question 15. So then moving forward, we can learn more about this. Here's an interactive uh, time zone map that you can check out more things, learning the difference between the noon meridian and what the subsolar point is. Uh, we can move forward looking at this diagram, figure 1.12, showing the sun obviously not to scale. <laughs> and we can see there's a subsolar point. The subsolar point is when the sun's rays are perpendicular to the Earth's surface. So there will be a special latitude every day that will receive a subsolar point. Well, what does that mean? Well, since the rays are perpendicular to the surface, at that exact moment, you would have no shadow because the light would be so perfectly above you that you wouldn't have a shadow. And this happens at different latitudes every day. It rotates. Uh, what's interesting, as you'll learn later, is that it's only between the two tropics that experience that. So I live in Los Angeles, about 34 degrees north of the equator. I will get close to a subsolar point, but I will never experience a subsolar point at my location because I'm too far north. So as you continue to work through this, you're gonna to get to question 16, which asks you some specific questions. So we know that, um, that being said, that every 15 degrees of rotation is equivalent to an hour. We also know that every one degree is equal to four minutes, or the other way around, that every four minutes we move one degree. So a question here, question 16 says, what would be the solar time of someone who lives one degree of longitude west of the noon meridian. So if a meridian is experiencing noon, solar noon, I mean I live at the noon meridian. I am experiencing solar noon. What time would it be for someone at that exact same moment who lives one degree west of me? Well one degree is equal to four minutes of time. And we have to decide is west earlier or later in time. And we know that west would be earlier in time. So we would be able to know that. Now I'm not going to spend too much time explaining this as I have a video that I'll share right here for you uh, within my how-to's on my YouTube channel to spend a little bit more time if you need additional support, all right? Uh, but you're going to learn how to calculate the different times between those locations across the board, okay? So let's put this together. So question 18 says, let's take greater distances into consideration. Assuming that you live at 40 degrees west longitude and it was solar noon or subsolar point at your location, what would be the solar time at each of the following different locations at that exact same moment? So how would you do this? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to plot you, your spot. We're at 40 west. So I'm going to put a little spot here that says I'm at 40 west and I am experiencing solar noon. Then I need to plot where the next person would be. So maybe it's you. Maybe you live at 60 degrees west. Well, 60 degrees west is to the left of me, which means I know it must be earlier in time. Then the next step is to calculate how many degrees separate me from you. And we know that it'll be uh, 20 degrees separate us. Well, now we need to convert those degrees into time. So the easiest way to do it is we know that again, 15 degrees is equal to one hour, or one degree is equal to four minutes. So you can just multiply it by four, right? So 20 times four gives you 80 minutes, which means that you are 80 minutes earlier than me, which is an hour and what? 20 minutes, right? So you're going to go ahead and solve what time would it be for you at letter A or B, C, and D. And make sure you go ahead and complete those. Uh, question 19 is the exact same question, just different locations. Again, if you need additional support, there are those videos in the how-to, which will be shared uh, within this video, so you can access that for additional support. So question 20, which is one of the last big math activities in this lab is assume that you're lost at sea on an old ship. It is possible to determine your longitude if you know your solar time and the time and longitude of a known location. So imagine way back when, when people were navigating the world, they would know the location and the time at one place, and then they would set off into the ocean, and by utilizing the sun and that known information, they're able to calculate where they are. 
looking at lines of longitude, which is pretty cool. So it says here in this particular location that what is known is that you are at solar noon which means that you are at the zenith, you have the sun at the highest point in the sky, you are at solar noon. We just don't know your longitude. But we do know that in for part A, that the prime meridian, the known location, is 3 p.m. So you need to then figure out, well, where are you in relation to that and how can I trans um, solve or transfer those degrees into time? So again, you know, noon, if I'm at noon and this is at 3 p.m., I must be earlier or westward of that. And then I need to find out how many hours separate me and then turn those hours into degrees. So it's kind of the same thing we did before, but just the other way around. Is that this time we want to turn the time into degrees. Again, that video that I have shared has great examples of how to do this if you need additional help. But again, I think just by taking the time and working out step by step the math, it'll make total sense. It's really not that big of a deal. You'll, you'll get through it. It looks, I think, overwhelming, but it really is not. It's quite easy. Another hint that I'll give you, specifically when it deals with, with part C, always travel the shortest distance always travel the shortest distance. Otherwise, I don't want to ride with you. If you're going to travel, if I have to go from here to there, I would travel the shortest distance. I'm not going to go all the way around the world to get there. Always find the shortest distance. Okay, that was my hint for you. Question 21 is asking you to reflect on this in your own words. Describe the differences between solar time and standard time in just two sentences. Moving forward, we get to part C, which is part of the public land survey. And this is something that I really enjoy teaching because I think it's a great way for us to tell. It's like a storytelling element. Um, we, we know that we have latitude longitude. We can see it on our phones, satellites, maps. Great. But something kind of predates that in the sense of the public land survey. I mean, like, I know. Latitude and longitude was introduced by Eratosthenes, who was the first geographer. Totally get that. But when it comes to the public land survey, it was a way that we can distribute property without having to know the latitude and longitude or even seeing what that area looks like. So this, we, again, we have a uh, check it out. Uh, it takes you to a, a link of baselines and meridians to learn how this was done. We have some guided practice videos, which is uh, a video that I put together to kind of help you, ex you know, explain a little bit more on how this is done. Uh, I'm gonna just jump straight into the diagram. So this is a sample diagram. Uh, again, the video shared above with the QR code takes you really in depth, step by step on how to do this. I'm just gonna kind of paint the picture real quick. So the way that this is done is it's it's broken in bits and pieces. So this would rep this would be wrapped on a state, and then each one of these boxes would be like you know the size of a county, and then if you subdivide that into smaller pieces, each one of these would represent a small town or community within that county, and then each one of these boxes can be broken up even smaller into smaller districts or neighborhoods as well as your home. So it's kind of that part the whole, the way I always explain this is that my home might be this box here and people go, well, where do you live? And I provide my address. They're like, uh, where's that? I'm like, oh, well, I live in part of Santa Clarita. Oh, where's that? Santa Clarita is part of Northern Los Angeles. Where's that? Southern California. So it's kind of that system of part the whole, start small to big, all right? So what we can see is first, if I start small to big, each one of these little boxes represents a location. It actually represents 40 acres of land, which explains a lot when you're driving on the freeway out in the middle of the desert and you see that land is in 40 acre parcels. So this would be someone's home. They live in the northwest corner of the northwest quadrant of section number 36. And section number 36 is part of the greater Township 4 North and Range 2 East. So it creates this code. Why is this important? Well, this was done, mostly done because of Thomas Jefferson, because when people were moving out west, they didn't know locations, properties, boundaries. It wasn't very clear. So how can we create 40-acre parcels of land for people to claim within a code? And, and 
I, if you think about going visiting the East Coast, roads cross and they're all wiggly and they're a nightmare. And they wanted to prevent that from happening again. So this was a grid system of really north to south, east to west, which is really nice. A great way to still see this in action is out in Palmdale, Lancaster, where you have a bunch of roads that are broken up in letters and numbers that are either east or west. So you can say, well, I live on Avenue S and I live on the street number 130 west. And you can see there's letters and numbers that kind of create that very nice grid or block system. So again, there's the video above that takes you step by step on how to do this. I just wanted to paint the picture. So what I've done here is I've created a map. So you're gonna treat each letter as its own entity because technically you'd redraw this every time and it's just too much paper to waste. So you're gonna start off with letter A, then move to letter B, C, D, and J. So I started off with letter J as an example. So if I lived at letter J, because my name starts with Jeremy, right? I live in the northwest quadrant or quarter of the greater southwest quadrant so northwest of the southwest I'm in this corner of this very small community I'm in section number one two three four five six seven eight section number eight and I live within township four north and range three west just like you wouldn't excel Again, the video above really goes into more depth as to how this, you know, why and how this works, uh, why we have the certain names and stuff like that. And this is our principal um, baseline, and this is our principal meridian, which is essentially your grid system, your Excel spreadsheet of latitude, longitude, these bigger boxes. How do we subdivide each box into something smaller and smaller and smaller? Uh, you know, to kind of put it in perspective, this box right here that is being marked, any of them actually, letter J, this is a 36 square mile box. That's a massive box. So each one of these is one square mile. That's a big, big area. So how do we subdivide this? Just like we did with latitude and longitude and degrees. How do we subdivide these areas into smaller pieces which would then become addresses? And that's how it's done. Well, again, I hope this was helpful. I know that I kind of, you know, push through this lab rather quickly because there are lots of great resources embedded within the lab itself of which I have shared all of the hyperlinks within this YouTube video uh, within the uh, description itself. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to comment below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and we'll talk soon.